The History of Technology and the Doctrine of Mass Destruction. So the critical question for this lecture is, was there deterrence theory and a theory of strategic warfare before nuclear weapons? Here you can see American bombers, B-17s, dropping payloads probably over Germany or Japan during the Second World War. Well, the answer is yes. Almost every aspect of deterrence existed, theoretically, before the existence of nuclear weapons. So what's deterrence? Deterrence is defined as a strategic posture in which putative aggression is deterred from military attack by fear of the consequences for their society as a whole. And this has always existed. Here you can see a portion of London collapsing after a bombing raid. During the Roman Empire and the Republic, most of the fighting was actually conducted by provincial auxiliaries, locally raised cavalry and light soldiery. However, when there was a regional threat in the form of threats from Germania, or threats from the Parthians, or threats from uh, the East, typically uh, Greek states in Asia Minor, the Roman legion would be deployed. And the Roman legion had a single purpose. It was to close with and destroy the urban centers of the enemy and everything that lay in its path to those urban centers. The legion was designed for siege warfare. They were both infantry and engineers, and they existed as the ultimate deterrent. The enemy city would be destroyed its inhabitants slaughtered or sold into slavery. The ultimate threat. The ancient equivalent of a nuclear weapon. Now aside from the threat of slaughter, deterrent forces can also threaten punishment short of annihilation. A famous example is from the American Civil War. U.S. Union General William T. Sherman took his cavalry force in an attempt to shorten the war, broke behind the lines of the Confederacy, and roamed around the rural areas inflicting punishment on the civilian homesteads and farms that supported the Confederacy. And this came to be known as Sherman's March to the Sea, and it occurred between September and December of 1864. Sherman gradually worked his way towards the Atlantic, and he burned and pillaged his way through the South, freeing the local slaves and spreading disorder in the rural community. Now, long before this, the distinction between civilian and military targets was a false one. There have been plenty of massacres of civilians by militaries on campaign throughout European history, as well as the history of other regions. Another application of punishment is the naval blockade. Although long practiced, it was not until the 20th century that you had states with large populations that were dependent on foreign food supplies in such a fashion that a blockade could starve them. The British blockade of Germany during the First World War brought some severe pressure on Germany, although retrospectively we uh, now know that uh, it had nowhere near the impact that the British uh, imagined it did on bringing uh, Germany's final internal collapse in 1917. That was largely caused by ineffective domestic politics in Germany and the fact that the German population had suffered through four years of war and no longer shared the political goals of the elite. Here you can see Italian bombers at the end of World War I. Duhay was the Italian theorist who developed the link between strategic bombing and the attack on civilian populations to short circuit political support for a war. And he was one of the first theorists to do it explicitly. With the advent of air power, you have for the first time and the opportunity of striking directly at the fickle urban populations of major countries. Now air power of course precedes aircraft. The Montgolfier brothers in France 
pioneered the use of balloons to rise in the sky. The first balloon crossed the uh, English Channel in 1794. Three years later, by 1797, Napoleon was using balloons as observation posts to direct artillery during the siege of Mantua in northern Italy. By the 1880s, airships became steerable, and this caused such alarm that there was a five-year ban placed on arming airships in the 1899 disarmament talks. H.G. Wells, in his book War in the Air, which was published in 1908, three years before his book on nuclear weapons, he envisioned a conflict in which countries would send dirigibles to fly over each other cities and then bomb them into oblivion. Below, you can see two pictures. The one on the bottom left are bombs being dropped over the port of Kobe, Japan during the Second World War. And on the lower right, you can see the Cathedral of Cologne uh, perching up out of the destruction of the Allied bombing of that city during the Second World War. So with the advent of aircraft, you have a more efficient and more directable application of air power against cities. In 1911, we have the first use of aircraft in war, when the Italians, during the Italian-Turkish War in Libya, used it to attack the Senussi tribes. On January 19th to the 20th, 1915, we have the first use of dirigibles, the German Zeppelins, to bomb England during the First World War. And this was guided by sort of a rough theory that you could strike the civilian populations and this would then spread terror, undermining support for the political regime. And to some extent it worked there were a great many spontaneous evacuations out of London and a great deal of worry. Now, an important aspect of bombing civilians was the expectation that they would panic. And this idea of panic goes back as an attack on the very orderly class-based societies typical of Western and Central Europe during the middle and the end of the 19th century. So panic in the sense of a theater fire, where a fire breaks out and then there's complete social disorder and people are clambering over each other to escape the, the fire. In a sense, the complete breakdown of social order. You could imagine this occurring in a horror movie, you know, typical of those horror movies in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, here you can see a picture of a Zeppelin on station. You can also see a pilot with some early bombs that were used for tactical bombing, but could ease, just as easily have been used against a city. Now, during the First World War, gas bombs were available, both to the Allies and the Germans. But we don't really know too much about the decision-making process in Germany. Although at the end of World War II, the archives were, were obtained from the Nazis and a great deal of senior Nazi officials and German generals were interviewed, at the end of the First World War, this didn't happen. So a lot of the analysis as to why gas bombing was not used in the First World War is unknown. It's generally thought that the threat of retaliation by the British and the French kept the Germans from using gas bombs against Allied cities. But there might have been other motives. It might have been thought uh, uh, something that was morally undesirable. We're not sure. Here you can see a picture of Halifax that was destroyed on December 6, 1917. There was a ammunition ship that caught fire and then detonated. It killed 1,500 people, and it was the largest explosion at the time, man-made explosion. And you can see here the damage near the port. Halifax sits on an incline, and so when the explosion happened, it was almost perpendicular to the cliffside where most of the homes were. And so the high density of population led to the high loss of life. 
During the interwar period, bombing theory was further developed by the Italian air warfare expert Giulio Duhay. He argued that air power permitted states to drop a combination of explosives, gas bombs, and incendiary devices. These are fire bombs, typically filled with magnesium, which burns without the need of oxygen at 3,000 degrees and is hot enough to melt iron and other structural materials that keep uh, buildings up. And that these combination of explosives could be dropped directly on civilian populations and cities. So ground forces, the conventional forces of the armies and the navies, would therefore be irrelevant. The opening hour of any war between great powers would consist of fleets of bombers devastating the major cities of their adversary, dropping gas that would stop the, the fire departments from extinguishing the flames, dropping incendiaries to burn down all the habitations and the factories, and dropping explosives cutting the water mains, further spreading the fires. And it was, thought, it was thought that these uh, perhaps day-long or week-long engagements would cause one population or the other population to give up and to pressure their government to surrender, and then the war would be over. So here we have a sort of a, a, an anatomy of a war that is very similar to our conception of a nuclear war, a war that would be very short and devastating and targeting vulnerable civilians at the outset and would therefore... Uh, not need large uh, ground-based armies. So it was believed that this type of attack would cause a massive panic that would quickly lead to societal collapse, particularly in the conception of the 19th century where populations were seen as poor and fickle and socialist and class warfare was rampant in every society, especially in the undisciplined urban populations where rural populations were hard-working and disciplined and conservative, urban populations were revolutionary and uh, very often challenging the social orders. So the logic was that the social dislocation would be so severe that either the central government would collapse or the surviving population would demand that the central government surrender. So in either case, in either strategy, the target was to inflict damage on the civilian government in the urban areas to provoke them into this action. It was believed that the moral effect of a gas incendiary explosive attack was 20 times the physical effect. This meant that for every individual that you killed or injured, there would be 20 that would be panicking, fleeing, or pressuring the government to change its policy. Now this effect was almost achieved in some cases, in bombings over Germany, bombings of England in World War II, bombings of Japan during the Second World War, and various bombings of uh, parts of Vietnam in the 1960s. November 14th to 15th, 1940, the Germans conducted a raid over the British city of Coventry, and it brought the local community almost to the point of total collapse. The system of rationing ceased to function, the local economic system collapsed because of the key officials being killed in the city. The fire departments uh, were non-responsive to many of the fires. It was a complete collapse, well hidden by British propaganda. You can see here uh, on the lower left a picture of uh, London damaged during the Second World War's bombing. And on the bottom right you can see a Zeppelin shot down by uh, British aircraft over England during the First World War. Here you can see Zeppelin raids over London at night during the First World War. So you'd have powerful searchlights that would seek out the source of the falling bombs, identify the Zeppelin, and then guide anti-aircraft fire, which often couldn't reach the high-flying Zeppelin or aircraft that had the ability to fly at high altitudes to then use incendiaries to try to burn and destroy the Zeppelin. You can see here, on the left side, the British underground, 
the subway system where the inhabitants of London took refuge during the various bombing raids. And if the bombing raid was extended, they would have to stay there all night. You can see in the bottom right the silhouette of a V-1 glide bomb, which was propelled by a Pulse aircraft engine. It was a very cost-effective cruise missile that inflicted a lot of damage. And the British had some effort shooting them down using anti-aircraft uh, artillery and aircraft that would tip the wings. However, life went on, and you can see in the top right a stall next to a destroyed grocery store. And it says in the caption, Hitler's bombs can't beat us. Our oranges came through Musos Lake. I'm not entirely sure what that's referring to, but essentially the grocery store is defiant and they're continuing to provide services to their clients. So there were many popular books, fiction books, describing surprise attacks and short, devastating wars, with the dead, the civilian dead, being contemplated in numbers never before faced by modern states. Major attempts were made in 1922 and 1932 to 1934 to ban military bombers, particularly long-range, heavy payload bombers that were designed to attack cities but agreements could only be reached on the use of chemical and biological weapons. Biological weapons were thought of as abhorrent. Chemical weapons, because of the memory of the First World War, were also seen as abhorrent, and there was a collective desire not to return to the use of chemical weapons either on the battlefield or as weapons used by bombers in attacking uh, the capital of enemy states. And it's out of this period that we have the term push-button warfare. Right? We very often associate that with nuclear weapons where uh, an artillery person will press a launch button in a military silo and a rocket will be launched uh, over uh, a great distance to attack another continent. But this was already a term being used. Uh, and it referred to the button that would be pressed in a bomber to release a payload of gas incendiaries and explosives on a civilian urban population. This term uh, originated with British Air Commodore Charlton in 1936. Now the Germans made use of their chemical industry and developed new nerve gases out of pesticides. And they were able to manufacture these nerve gases on an industrial scale. The British and the Canadians in support lacked a comparable industry. So the British focused on anthrax, bio-war. And the British developed patty cakes that they could deploy in uh, Germany by aircraft into the ecosystem and into the farm system that would infect animals and then people. Anthrax has a special characteristic that its spores resist the ultraviolet radiation of the sun, which is very uncommon. And it has a, a very high uh, kill rate uh, if it comes in through the lungs. Here you can see uh, children in uh, little babies in uh, chemical, biological uh, weapons protection suits along with the nurses and their gas masks. German soldiers uh, during the Second World War would have these uh, metal containers at the back of their uniforms that they carried almost uh, to the middle of the war and those contained gas masks. And in fact, most soldiers up until the middle of the Second World War would carry gas masks because there was always the real possibility that a gas war uh, would break out. And there were huge quantities of gas that were shipped around uh, following the armies during the war. In fact, there was a, an incident where the Germans bombed an American uh, merchant vessel in Barry Harbor, Italy. And that ship was carrying the mustard gas for the U.S. Uh, mortar units what are called the American Chemical Mortar Units, and it released the gas on the port facility, killing a great many uh, Italian dock workers and soldiers that were deployed there. This is the effect of anthrax on the skin. Uh, essentially, you have necrotic tissue or dead tissue, and you have pustules that form around it. Uh, anthrax is, of course, um, very uh, virulent. Um, it spreads and it inflicts serious damage on its victims. This is a Grenard Island where anthrax was tested uh, by the British uh, on sheep. 
and uh, for over 50 years the island was a no-go area, uh, although it's been more recently decontaminated uh, and is now accessible. Uh, for half a century it was not. These are some of the uh, facilities at Porton Downs where the anthrax was manufactured by the English and the Canadians in order to deploy against the Germans. And I should ultimately point out that when the Second World War broke out and the British declared war on Germany, the message, that, the question rather, that came immediately after the British declaration of war against Germany for the German invasion of Poland uh, on the 1st of September 1939 was, uh, do you Germany comply with the Biological and Chemical Weapons Convention? And the Germans responded yes, and that was the last official communication between the English and the Germans. And it was later communicated secretly through Spain by uh, Admiral Canaris, the German head of Abwehr, their army intelligence, that uh, Germany was committed to not using um, uh, chemical weapons. Now the Germans imagined the British had a chemical industry and that there was a process of mutual deterrence, but in reality it was a British bioweapons arsenal that was deterring the German uh, chemical weapons arsenal. And then these two mutually deterring arsenals uh, kept the war from becoming um, uh, similar to the First World War where chemical weapons were deployed on the battlefield. This is a depiction of the last major bubonic plague in Europe, the 1721 Plague of Marseille, which caused massive social dislocation. The French army was deployed, as well as the French navy. They completely sealed off the city. No one was allowed in or out. Prisoners were freed um, and were told that uh, if they buried the dead, they would then be given their freedom. But it still killed a very large portion of the population it was uh, devastating and at the, with the technology at the time there was just nothing anyone could do. So as a consequence most major European powers developed bombers and gas weapons. But when the Second World War broke out the British made their declaration of war with an official request for Germany's confirmation of the Biological and 1925 Chemical Weapons Convention. It was also proposed that the League of Nations take control of all bombers and use them to enforce world peace. These were goals that Nazi Germany was pursuing. Now the British and the Germans deterred each other and ultimately these arsenals were never used. The British were uh, thinking, contemplating the use of chemical weapons in Iraq against the Kurds, but it was never actually uh, carried through in the interwar period. The British also uh, had planned to use chemical weapons against the Pashtun in Afghanistan and the frontier, frontier area of British India, what is today Pakistan, and that was also um, refused uh, by uh, the uh, imperial leadership. But the British did use gas in their intervention against the Russian communists uh, in Murmansk when they tried to roll back the uh, communist revolution uh, in Russia. The Italians used chemical weapons successfully against both the Ethiopian military and urban targets in 1935. The Egyptians used chemical weapons against Yemeni tribesmen in the early 1960s, including phosgene and mustard gas. The Iraqis and the Iranians used chemical weapons against each other, and the Iraqis used it against the Kurds at Kermanshah and Halabja during the Gulf War in the 1980s. You can see on the bottom left a depiction of the biological weapons research facilities within the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And you can see the general location on the bottom right of the Iran-Iraq war on their common frontier. The one exception during World War II of the use of biological weapons was by the Japanese and they used both gas and biological weapons in their war in China. Unit 100 and Unit 731 conducted unconscious vivisections on Chinese subjects that had been infected with a variety of diseases. In one case the Japanese infected in a controlled experiment a village of 5,000 persons with the bubonic plague. It was the largest controlled epidemiological experiment at Changchun. In an excerpt from a letter 
from Major Ishii Shiro, who is the initiator of the Japanese biological weapons research in China, to his superiors in late 1932. He says, quote, Due to your great help, we've already achieved a great deal in our bacteria research. It is time we start to experiment. We appeal to be sent to Manchukuo to develop new weapons. Close quote. You can see in the picture on the left, Unit 731 complex at Pingfan, China, where you had uh, Russian and Chinese and other prisoners that were experimented on uh, into the 1940s. You can see also uh, on the top right an individual, a, a captive, uh, who's been uh, infected with some biological agent. And you can see an autopsy being conducted on a dead experimental victim by Japanese doctors. This is a banquet of the Japanese doctors from Unit 731 during the China War before the outbreak of the Second World War. None of these individuals were prosecuted in exchange for technical information on biowarfare to the Americans. None of them were imprisoned. Many of them ended up being senior hospital administrators into the 1950s and the 1960s. The Second World War did see a number of devastating individual bombing attacks. For example, the German raids on Rotterdam and Holland in 1940, the German raid on Belgrade and Yugoslavia in 1941, and the German raid on Stalingrad and the Soviet Union in 1942, each of which killed thousands, typically refugees fleeing, uh, packing the roads. The major campaigns included the German bombings of England in 1940 during the Battle of Britain, the V1 and V2 attacks by the Germans on London in 1944 and 1945, as well as their attacks on Antwerp in Belgium, the Anglo-American bombing of Germany and Japan. All of these generally indicated that domestic populations were far more resilient than believed. The dead, for example, they don't panic, and the living adapt to difficult circumstances. It was thought in the Franco-Prussian War that populations were fickle. In 1870, the Germans, being led by the Prussians, defeated the French forces at Sedan on the border and quickly advanced and then put Paris under siege. While Paris was under siege, rather than attack the city, the Germans shelled it to provoke the poor parts of the city to revolt. And these they did. What emerged was Le Commune. These were uprisings of poor French urban civilians against the political elite, particularly Napoleon III's leadership. And this war, of course, ended his leadership. It became so dramatic that the French elite were afraid of losing control of Paris. And so they made a peace deal with the Germans in exchange for giving up Alsace and Lorraine to the Germans and paying an indemnity, the Germans would leave, but the French would then be able to turn their guns on La Commune, which they did. And there was attacks and mass executions of those French civilians that revolted. So this idea that you could provoke poor populations to revolt became the model by which bombing would change the politics of the target country. You would target and inflict pain on this fickle revolutionary population that disliked the wealthy elite. But when World War II came along, this is not what happened. When civilian populations were bombed, they became uh, uh, adaptable to their situation. They generally coalesced with their political leadership, regardless of which political system they were fighting under, whether it was um, England, uh, or the Soviet Union, or Japan, or Germany, and even Italy. Populations adapted. They did not panic. There was no um, uh, ratio, high ratio of um, moral um, uh, uprisings compared to the number of uh, physical losses. Here you can see a uh, German uh, V1 glide bomb at the top. On the right, you can see a V2 rocket. These rockets were not quite exoatmospheric, but they brought uh, 
tear down on both London, faster than the speed of sound, and on uh, Antwerp. And again, you can see uh, parts of London burning during the Second World War. Now, where the U.S. used daylight precision bombing against precise industrial targets in Germany, like ball bearing factories, when the U.S. turned their bomber force in Japan, they copied the British practice of mass nighttime bombing of entire urban centers with a view to directly hurting the civilian population, specifically to kill industrial workers. So the bombings of Dresden uh, by the English and Hamburg and Tokyo killed more people than either atomic attacks at Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Here you can see a B-52 bomber that was deployed selectively against non-urban targets in North Vietnam. Uh, sometimes the attacks would get very close to cities and you'd have large-scale evacuations and even shock in some of the strikes by the American Air Force against Vietnam, but never did the Americans directly target civilian populations during uh, their bombing raids of North Vietnam. Their targets were overwhelmingly industrial and infrastructural. But you can see here uh, the map of North Korea, including the exclusion zones in downtown Hanoi and Haiphong, which was the uh, main port into North Vietnam. Here you can see a map on the top of the different cities that were bombed. You can see the fire raids on Osaka, the fire raids on Nagoya and Tokyo, and Kobe. And you can also see the two nuclear detonations in Nagasaki and Hiroshima. At the bottom of the picture, you see a squadron of British Lancaster bombers. So it typically consists of 15 bombers. You can see here depicted all of the crews of the bombers. And what they're not showing you are all the ground crews that repair the bombers and operate the airfields from which these bombers operate. These bombers overwhelmingly operated against civilian targets during uh, the Second World War. So here we have a city devastated by bombing. This of course is downtown Tokyo, the result of conventional bombing. You can see how the high explosives have damaged the buildings and left foundations and the trees are burned by the incendiaries. Again, conventional bombing, destruction of downtown Tokyo using high explosives. You can see in the foreground, some of the wooden structures are not burned, probably because of the natural fire breaks. And you can see that the, the uh, tram system, the urban commuter train system is still functional. So the devastation was not total. Here again, severe destruction, but this was brought by conventional bombing, not by a nuclear attack. Aha, what do we have here? This is obviously a conventional attack, and you can see it by the craters. A nuclear weapon that was detonated in the, uh, in the air would not have left a crater. The incendiary component of the American bombing force has completely burned down all of the habitable structures. Now there's a lot of reaction in the US to the British bombing of Dresden near the end of the Second World War. The British dropped incendiaries. It boiled away the river that went through downtown Dresden. And the way incendiaries work is they, they also burn all the oxygen out of the air, leading to a firestorm, which is a cyclone. And this cyclone uh, basically spreads fire more easily. And so the American journalists reacted against this practice of British bombing near the end of the war as immoral. And of course, the British uh, had a very different take. For them, it was uh, a part of the war. The Germans had bombed civilian targets in England, like Coventry, and so the British got their own at the end of the Second World War. The American journalists argued there were no military targets in Dresden. It was simply an entrepot and a crossroads of the rail network, and it was filled with German refugees, civilians fleeing the, the advancing Soviet armies uh, from the east. 
here you can see an American B-17 bomber uh, dropping bombs over Germany. Now, in Germany, the effect of the bombing was a cost on industrial efficiency. But in Japan, in the remaining months of the war, it was actually causing what Duhay would have described as social collapse. Whole towns and cities were being spontaneously emptied, and the central government was unable to restore order. You had an outbreak of petty crime, something which was typically unheard of in peacetime. The level of trust between Japanese families and households and communities completely fell apart, especially as public services collapsed. So these effects were similar to those observed in Hanoi by independent ambassadors during the American bombings of, of that uh, areas outside of the city. It was also observed by uh, independent ambassadors in Tehran during the Iran-Iraq war as the Iraqis rained Scud missiles and other missiles down on Tehran. At least 50% of the population of Tehran evacuated to the outskirts and into the rural areas, fearing that at any time Saddam Hussein could have fired a chemically uh, loaded uh, rocket at the city. Now, as the Japanese were falling prey to U.S. bombing at the end of the Second World War, they decided to create their own form of deterrence. Japan sent balloons laden with conventional explosives across the Pacific towards the U.S. They were able to do this because the Japanese had, before anyone else, discovered the slipstream. The slipstream is a narrow band of high altitude air that can move up to speeds of 500 kilometers an hour. The Americans only discovered it when they deployed bombers over Japan and suddenly bombers caught in the slipstream would be flying backwards over Japan. In fact, it was not even believed by the commander of the uh, uh, Air Force, Hap Arnold. Uh, he had to actually get up into a bomber and experience it for himself to believe it. So the Japanese took advantage of the slipstream, which uh, went very quickly from Japan across the Pacific in some sort of snaky band, uh, then over North America. Now the intention was to signal to the Americans that Japan could inflict as much damage on the U.S. as the U.S. was inflicting on Japan. And so the Japanese filled these balloons with explosives. But they implied and assumed the Americans knew that the Japanese could fill these equally with chemical or biological agents. Now ultimately, this compellent threat or this deterrent threat didn't work. The Americans clamped down on any news about these uh, balloons that floated over. And so the public in the U.S. was barely aware of it. So starting on November 3, 1944, and for the next five months, Japan launched 9,300 explosive carrying balloons towards the U.S. to signal that if the U.S. continued to conduct its bombing of Japan, then Japan would gas the U.S. with these balloons. However, very few of the balloons actually reached the U.S. It was not until after the war was over that the U.S. realized the degree to which uh, Japan was invested in trying to signal its deterrent to the U.S. 285 of the balloons made it. One killed six onlookers who had found it. A very tragic story of a family that was out at a picnic and a child found it and the entire family went to look at it and all six were killed. There was another which started a brush fire adjacent to the Hanford Atomic Processing Facility, causing it to shut down as an emergency uh, precaution and delaying the production of the atomic bomb. Uh, at first, uh, it was thought that it was a very well calculated sabotage, but then it was realized that it was simply the wildest stroke of luck. So the term weapon of mass destruction is a Soviet term, and it refers to this whole family of chemical, biological, and nuclear weapons. Here you can see depicted the two separate uh, balloons, uh, um, and you can see more clearly the one on the right with the explosives um, being uh, hung off the uh, gantry um, underneath the uh, balloon itself. This is a map of Montreal, and for class, you should have some idea of what the major public utilities and important facilities are on the island.